we have already talked about walking in the spirit, living in the spirit, and having spiritual victory. But I want to back up today. And I want to back all the way up to make sure that we dot every I and cross every T as we talk about your role in this Christian walk and the Holy Spirit's role in this Christian walk. But I want you to turn to John chapter 4. Uh, I saw some interest in there. Uh, but let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you because we got you. And you got us. And Father, it states, how can two walk together unless they both agree? And Father, we agree that you're God and we're your children. So we agree. So Father, I pray you give us insight and wisdom on how to walk, live before you. And we will give you praise and glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The reason I want you to go back to John 4, because that is a very inner, a unique statement that Jesus made. And I want to lift it. We're not going to necessarily talk about it, but I just want to lift it to give you, to point you in the way we're going. And listen to this story that Jesus got caught up in in John chapter 4. Verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water from like to, to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, you want to stop right there. And how much is it that we don't know? And does it matter if we know or not? And it matters a great deal. It's the difference between the sweet taste of victory and the agony of defeat. This woman has been living a defeated life. But if she wanted to taste a sweet taste of victory, she had to get something from Jesus. And that's where I want to bring us. I want to bring us to a place where we really understand without him or walking with him, we can have no victory. We become victims of Satan and this world. So, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 2. Back to the beginning. And let's see how we got here. Uh, and I'm going to try to lay a foundation here because um, I want you to be able to stand on the foundation and receive from the foundation everything that God has promised to give to you. In Ephesians 2, it starts off by saying, And you were dead in your trespass and sins, in which you walked according to the course of this world, according to the principal power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedient. That was us. That's where we started from. Not such a good start, but that's where we started. Recognizing our deadness, recognizing that we needed life. And what does a dead man need but life? And so here we are, and we're going to 
see what did he mean by that? Because when you look back at the woman at the well, she fits this scripture. She was dead. He says, and you were dead in your trespass and sin. That's what she was. But what she needed was living water. And Christ was the only one that would give her the living water. But where she falls short at, when he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Because what you need, what I need, is living water. And that's just to say that I need to be made alive. The verse says, you are walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit is not working in the sons of disobedience. That's Satan and his handiwork. So let's talk about being born. You were born dead, physically alive, but spiritually dead. Dead means that you can't relate to anything. You can't respond to it. I'm sure all of us have been to a funeral or two. And no matter what was going on in the atmosphere, no matter what was going on in the room, the person in the casting could not relate at all. They never said a word. Because when you're dead, you have no response. And that's how we were spiritually. We were dead to Christ, dead to God, dead to the Holy Spirit. And unless he make us alive, you cannot live not only in this life, but even in the afterlife. And so Paul is saying, you got to get the Spirit first before you can are able to walk in the Spirit. So because we are dead, it goes on to say, verse number three, among them we too all formerly live in the lust of our flesh and do the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But here come the other side of but. Verse four, but God. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And let me add one more verse. Verse 6, And raise us up with him and seat us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where we were. That's where we are. So when you come alive, and the only way to come alive spiritually, is by way of the gospel. Uh, Romans 1 and 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But then verse 17. In it is the righteousness of God. For us to come alive and be right with God, you got to pass by the gospel. You got to believe in the gospel. You got to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. You got to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So, uh, so now we're seeing if we're going to walk in the spirit, we've got to have the spirit. If you ever come alive, you're going to have the Spirit. So that's not a problem. The problem is when you live or you walk in, in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Spirit is in control of you. Your walk, your talk, your actions, your motives, your behaviors, your emotion, your attitude. Uh, your values is the Holy Spirit in charge 
and giving you what you need. So for us to have that life and have it abundantly, we must be made alive. And the only one can do that is God. Now, we may have said in the past, I just need to say it again, and that's in verse 1, Paul had to pray for them that they may understand. My prayer for you is that you would understand because there's so much power in that, uh, in the gospel and in us stepping out of darkness into light in the fact of becoming spiritual for the first time becoming spiritual because we have the spirit on the inside and we are walking according to the spirit now you can have the sweet taste of victory because the holy spirit is really all you need with him come the word of God and everything you receive is going to be because of grace not because you deserve it not because you earned it but simply because God has graced you forgiven you and put this power in you so because really what I really want to talk about is living between two resurrection but let me point out the resurrection in chapter 2. This is the resurrection, the spiritual resurrection, where you're being made spiritually alive. In verse number 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. That is the first resurrection. And I keep coming back to this because I haven't heard a lot of this. He has made you alive. And that's where we begin. That's where we come close to God and we walk in with God in such a way only because he gifted us he gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and now we are living in the Spirit, being controlled by the Spirit, having victory because of the Spirit, the Spirit of God, that is, the Holy Spirit. Then we can look back and say, God gave me abundant life, just like he said. So, This is what I want to do. I want to pray. And this is what I want to pray. I want to pray the same prayer that Paul prayed in chapter 1 and verse number um, 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what, is the, and what is the surpassing greatness? And what is the surpassing greatness that he has towards us, the power towards us? Now we're going to pick right back up at that and then look at what that power looks like. But let's begin, but let's pray and thank God for our time. Father, we thank you. We love you. We worship you and we adore you. Thank you for uh, this time of looking in your word and allowing your word to get in us so we can live a victorious life. So we love you and we praise you. We ask you things in Jesus' name. Amen.